Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, I decided to approach uh, my discussion today uh, just uh, to set up some of the uh, historical facts of the matter in Western Sahara, um, whereas I think my esteemed colleagues will be addressing the more uh, important minutia of international law. Um, the framing here is uh, between myths and realities. And I think those of us who spend a lot of time reading the press uh, we'll have seen many of these myths encountered. Uh, those of us who follow the political situation and the diplomatic situation will see even more of these myths um, emerge. And what I want to do is very quickly go through them and uh, explain how uh, they're basically factually incorrect as far as the history of the conflict uh, goes. So uh, let's talk about the, the first myth. Uh, I see this all the time <laughs> in media reporting uh, on Western Sahara, uh, which is the myth that Spain left Western Sahara uh, and then Morocco and Mauritania occupied it. Uh, and this is entirely backwards in terms of the actual history of the what happened in Western Sahara. And it's important because it helps to establish certain legal facts when it comes to uh, Morocco's status in the territory, how it was acquired, and why we should consider a Mor Morocco an occupying power above all in Western Sahara. So those of us who are familiar with this history know it quite well that when Morocco announced the Green March in the middle of October 1975, Spain was in full possession of Western Sahara. Spain had not left. Spain was not planning on leaving in any, uh, you know, in, in the coming weeks or that sort of thing. The timetable for Spanish withdrawal wasn't exactly clear at the moment. Uh, there was, uh, people were waiting for the famous opinion of the International Court of Justice. But uh, what we do know is that in October, 1975, uh, before Morocco announced the Green March, and we'll talk a little bit about what the Green March means, but. Uh, Spain was fully committed to Western Sahara's independence. Spain wasn't just going to organize a, a vote. Spain was already planning on simply handing the territory independence. Spain was also working with, uh, or at least in, in contact with Polisario. By this uh, point in the history of the conflict, Polisario had been formed in 1973. Polisario had waged a guerrilla war. Uh, to pressure Spain to leave the, the colony. And uh, for various reasons, Spain decided it was important to establish relationships with Polisario, perhaps because when the UN sent a visiting mission of the General Assembly in the summer of 1975, the visiting mission saw that there was overwhelming support for Polisario and independence in the territory among the population, and that the Spanish uh, puppet uh, party, the one that was supposed to uh, be installed, uh, did not receive as much support uh, according to the UN visiting mission. So it was clear to Spain that uh, were its interests going to be continued in Western Sahara, it should probably have relations with Polisario, not to mention the fact that Polisario had Spanish prisoners of war in its custody, right? So the, the thing to keep in mind is that when Morocco announced the Green March, uh, that Spain had no intention of leaving uh, until self-determination was fulfilled, right? So it's really the Green March that changes uh, what happened in Western Sahara. And so what are the consequences of this reality? That's very important, right? The thing to remember is that Morocco gained Western Sahara by threatening war with Spain. This is often left out of the histories. Uh, it's never mentioned in news reporting on Western Sahara. And that is the fact that beginning in the summer of 1975, Morocco began moving its forces deep into the south of Morocco into the part of Morocco that we call Spanish Southern Morocco. Uh, they were amassing along various points of the border with the Spanish Sahara uh, that these troops uh, were uh, in a position to invade the territory by October, 1975. And the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States sent a warning uh, to Henry Kissinger, then the Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, 
warning Kissinger that Morocco, uh, that King Hassan II of Morocco was determined to invade the Spanish Sahara, right? This is before the Green March was announced. This is before the International Court of Justice opinion was announced. This is before the UN Visiting Mission Report was announced, right? So the, Uni the United States, through various sources, uh, spies and signals intelligence, had already learned that King Hassan was dedicated to invading the territory. And according to the former ambassador who was in Algiers at the time, one of the most important people uh, protecting King Hassan, uh, Vernon Walters, uh, uh, in the National Security Council, had received an advanced plan of the Green March uh, be months before it was ever announced, right? So this is really important, right? To keep in mind that uh, Morocco threatened force against Spain, a European country, not, not a NATO state at that point, but you know, a close ally of the United States where the United States had military bases and other relationships, right? And the thing to remember is that when King Hassan announced the Green March, he said, if Spain attempts to block the Green March, we will have no choice but to respond with military force, right? That is a clear, <laughs> that is a clear declaration of an intent to use military force to gain a territory uh, without, uh, you know, without legal right, right? Uh, and to use force uh, against another state. Right. So why didn't the UN Security Council respond in kind? Right. The United Nations was founded above all else to preserve international peace and security. That is to stop states from waging war against each other and acquiring territory by force. And that's something to keep in mind is that this is a, a violation of the most fundamental principle of the United Nations, and that is the prohibition of expansion of territory by force, right? The whole reason the United States went to war against Iraq in Kuwait in 1991, well, not, not the, the whole reason, but at least the, the superficial legal reason why the United States did that in 1990, 1991, right? Uh, so why didn't the Security Council respond, uh, especially using its uh, full uh, weight of international law to prevent Morocco from acquiring territory by force? Well, as we know from the US representative on the UN, at the time, he made sure, uh, based upon uh, guidance from Henry Kissinger, the White House, the Ford White House at the time, that the United Nations proved ineffective in doing anything to prevent Morocco from acquiring the territory. And as we know, the United States was policy was to make sure that Morocco got the territory uh, and that there would be a rigged referendum. I mean, this is explicit in the conversations between President Ford and Henry Kissinger, is that they wanted a rigged referendum like they did in West Papua. Um, so keep in mind that uh, although this should have been treated as a much more serious issue by the Security Council, considering what it entailed, you know, the threat of uh, war uh, against uh, Spain, that the United States uh, made sure that the Security Council didn't respond, right? So this is uh, one of the consequences of recognizing the real history of Western Sahara. Now, myth number two, Morocco is not an occupying power, right? This is uh, often denied most vehemently by uh, the Moroccans as well as their, their allies. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, as we know from the 2002 legal opinion of the United Nations, right, the highest legal office within, within the U UN, that one administering power, that is Spain in this case, cannot legally transfer administration to another power. Uh, and in the case of Western Sahara, it was Morocco and Mauritania through the nefarious Madrid agreements of uh, November 1975, right? So we know that Morocco has no legal standing within Western Sahara as an administering power, that is, as a colonizing power. Morocco isn't even listed as having any relationship to Western Sahara on the official UN list of non-self-governing territories, right? So if you go and look up that list, you can Google it, check it out. What does it say? Well, uh, you know, it shows you all of the American colonies, the British colonies, the French colonies, so on and so forth. But it has a footnote where it mentions that Spain uh, claims to have divested itself of administering power, right? But as we learned in 2002, this actually, uh, uh, can't be done under international law, and there's no status as de facto administering power, right? And this has huge con uh, consequences in terms of 
Morocco's exploitation of natural resources in the territory, as we've learned from subsequent uh, rulings from the, uh, the European Court of Justice and other bodies, right? And also keep in mind that uh, Carlos uh, Ruiz Miguel has put together a very beautiful book, Western Sahara Selected Primary Legal Sources, right? Where he highlights UN, OAU, African Union, and European Union documents that have all described Morocco as an occupier, right? So it's not only established by the facts of the matter in Western Sahara, the acquisition of territory by threatened force, uh, and the fact that Morocco has no status within Western Sahara other than the fact that they're just there, right? Uh, but we have uh, documents of the, you know, probably the most important international legal bodies uh, one could encounter, uh, political and legal bodies, saying that this is an occupation, right? So what are the consequences? Well, there are probably many consequences to this, and I'm sure the other guests will mention these. But the one that comes to mind for me is the applicability of the Geneva Conventions, right? Especially the prohibition of population transfer. And as we know, there are tens of thousands of Moroccan settlers who have moved to Western Sahara, some by choice, but many uh, were relocated during the quote unquote second Green March, uh, during the effort by Morocco to influence the referendum on independence, as well as military personnel and their families, uh, people who were there for economic reasons and those who were subsidized by the state through through various means, right? So uh, like the Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands, the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara has involved an effort to change facts on the ground through demographic warfare. So myth, myth number three, the International Court of Justice in 1975 recognized ties between Morocco and Western Sahara that existed in 1884-85, right? And that date is important because that's the date at which Spain first asserts uh, rights to Western Sahara as a colonizing power. Now, you often see that there's a, a little bit of the International Court of Justice opinion that Moroccans like to like to highlight, uh, that their defenders like to highlight. And even a, even a friend of mine argued with me recently that uh, I, was, I had dismissed too easily uh, the fact that the court had recognized ties, right? Well, first of all, what are these ties? Well, the court is, is very clear that these are ties of allegiance. The word sovereignty uh, is not used, even though, keep in mind, the court took into uh, its consideration Morocco's own definition of sovereignty, which involves the very strange concepts of blad uh, machsen, uh, which is you know the state lands that are effectively under state control, but also the blad asiba, which is a sort of an assertion like saying that well, even if we didn't have sovereignty over those people, you know they're, they're it's a part of our national territory, which is a very bizarre concept uh, under international law. But the court was willing to entertain it. Right, but even then, Morocco couldn't produce any evidence that this was actually the case in Western Sahara. And when we look at the court's opinion, right, these ties of allegiance, right, and the court is very specific about this. They're between uh, Tekna tribes, right, and if you know anything about the ethnography of Western Sahara, the Tekna is one of the most complicated, one could say, of the larger tribal groupings uh, within what are often called Sahrawi. Uh, the, the social milieu of Sahrawi society, right? Because it involves uh, not only tribes that inhabited the northern parts of Western Sahara and the southern parts of Morocco, but also include a large part of uh, Berber, Tashilhate speaking uh, groups, right? But the court is very clear that the, the ties of allegiance that they're talking about are between the Moroccan monarchy and techno tribes of the Noon region. Now, what is the Noon? The Noon is uh, a river region in southern Morocco that demarcated the difference, uh, the area between French Morocco and Spanish uh, southern Morocco, right? So we're talking about areas that are well within uh, Morocco proper and that are nowhere near Western Sahara, relatively speaking, right? So again, another thing to keep in mind is that Morocco was unable to present any internal or international evidence of sovereignty over Western Sahara in 1884, right? Or the centuries before, 
right? The Moroccan case was built upon this idea that, well, we have evidence from our own history and we have evidence that other states recognized our sovereignty over Western Sahara. When in fact, uh, a lot of the evidence, especially the international evidence, says the exact opposite. A lot of it is the Moroccan Sultan saying, I don't have control over those people down there. You know, so if your ships are wrecked there, I can't do anything to help you, right? So in many ways, the evidence that even Morocco presented to the court was contradictory, right? So what are the, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are that uh, people focus too much on question two that was put to the International Court of Justice. And that was the question of Moroccan and Mauritanian claims on Western Sahara. Well, what was question one, right? Question one is even more important, but is always overlooked, right? And question one is very clear uh, because it asks, was Western Sahara terra nullius, that is no man's land, right? A country that belonged to no one in 1884. And the International Court of Justice is very clear when it says, no, Western Sahara belonged to the Western Saharans who were socially and politically organized in such a way as to competently represent themselves to any foreign power, right? So if you read the International Court of Justice opinion clearly, what does it say? It says what the sovereign power in Western Sahara in 1884, 1885 is the Western Saharans, right? Um, so Western Sahara's right to self-determination isn't just given by the fact that it was placed on the UN list of non-self-governing territories in the 1960s, but by the International Court of Justice saying they were the sovereign power to begin with. Uh, and so therefore they deserve the right to independence. Now, myth number four, uh, this is probably something that's a bit more recent uh, and something that I think needs to be confronted as well. Uh, since Morocco issued its 2007 autonomy proposal, it's been described as serious, credible, and in, in recent years as realistic, right? So let, let's talk about each of these, realistic, serious, and credible. Uh, in reality, is it a credible offer uh, to Polisario? Well, in terms of international legal standards, it doesn't even meet the definition of autonomy, right? The definition of autonomy is based upon the idea that a central government cannot abolish the local autonomous government, right? And nowhere in Morocco's proposal does it lay out any provisions that suggest the King of Morocco cannot arbitrarily, willy-nilly abolish the locally elected government in Western Sahara, right? Because Morocco's autonomy proposal would require substantial changes to the Moroccan constitution, including very powerful prohibitions on the power of the Moroccan monarchy to assert control over locally elected, uh, locally installed governing officials, right? So <clears throat> what else makes this proposal not credible? Well, the fact that Morocco refuses to negotiate over it, right? Uh, the King of Morocco in his annual Green March speeches has said uh, on several occasions that this proposal is the most that Morocco can offer. So if we think about that, the most, the most that Morocco can offer is not even autonomy. So the autonomy they're offering is not autonomy and they're not even offering more than that, right? They're offering at best something maybe akin to a kind of lightly devolved local governance that doesn't really matter because Morocco is such a highly centralized Jacobin state that you know the freedoms uh, would be limited to the freedom to, I don't know, pick up your own garbage uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we know that it's not a credible offer uh, because Morocco is willing to uh, discuss it, right? Paul Sario, during the negotiations with Christopher Ross said, okay, Let's let's talk about your proposal. Let's make it better. And even then, Morocco refused to negotiate, saying, you have to accept this. It's a take it or leave it offer. Right. So that tells us a lot about the proposal uh, in terms of its credibility. Is it serious? Well, uh, in, from 2001 to 2004, Morocco refused to tell Baker, right, James Baker, who was the uh, personal envoy at the time, what they would accept for autonomy. Because remember, in the year 2000, the Security Council uh, put the entire referendum process, right, the entire six-year process of evaluating over 244,000 candidates uh, for uh, the, the vote in Western Sahara, that that was put on pause in 2007. 
because there was going to be a, a pursuit of something called a political agreement. And so from 2001 to 2004, uh, Morocco uh, was put on the spot because it was Morocco who rejected the referendum. Uh, and so everyone said, okay, Morocco, if you don't want a referendum, then what do you want? And Morocco refused uh, to work with Baker. At first, uh, Baker uh, developed plans on his own, the 2001 framework agreement, and then the 2003 peace plan. In both cases, those were devised with minimal input uh, from Morocco, and that Baker went to international legal experts instead, who drew upon plans from the CPA in South Sudan and the, uh, the negotiations over Aceh. Uh, so when Morocco's 2007 proposal finally came out, uh, what we now know uh, is that Morocco was only doing that because Elliot Abrams uh, in the Bush White House had promised a quid pro quo of US recognition. So Morocco had developed its autonomy plan. And remember, it's not, it's not even really an autonomy plan, right? Morocco's settlement plan uh, was developed in exchange for promises of recognition that were fortunately at that time stopped by the US State Department. And as we know from WikiLeaks, US officials openly mocked Morocco's autonomy proposal as being uh, insufficient, not enough. Uh, and as, as I've noted, right, it's not even really autonomy. Right, and then the other question is: If Morocco is serious uh, about autonomy, why hasn't Morocco just implemented it unilaterally? Right, if Morocco is so dedicated to uh, willingly govern Western Th Sahara through autonomy, why not just begin implementing autonomy? If autonomy is the magic solution to the question of Western Sahara, why not start that solution? Right now, why do why is Morocco waiting for Polisario's consent uh, to uh, give up Western Sahara's right to independence to begin the process of implementing autonomy? Uh, and that tells you all you need to know uh, in terms of the fact that Morocco is not even really interested in autonomy. Because if they were, they would implement it and show to the world what a what a model of good governance it is. Instead. Morocco spends its time blocking negotiations and beating Sahrawi activists in the streets. Now, is it a realistic solution, right? Well, uh, autonomy has been on the agenda since at least the 1980s, uh, but it still uh, hasn't proven to be a solution. So if it's a realistic solution, then why can't the parties um, agree on it, right? Uh, one would think that if it is the optimal solution, uh, then it would have been arrived at by this point, right? Uh, the other thing to consider is that autonomy has a very bad track record in terms of maintaining international peace and security. If you look at cases like Kosovo, Eritrea, and others, uh, territories that had autonomy but were abolished by central governments unilaterally uh, often led uh, to uh, very bloody wars. Right. So who's to say that autonomy in Western Sahara wouldn't be abolished by Morocco, leading to uh, a far worse kind of war than we've seen in Western Sahara, one in which the refugees and Polisario itself have already returned to the territory. Right. And this brings us to an even more important fact. Right. When all of these governments around the world say that Morocco's autonomy proposal is realistic, serious, and credible, do they realize what a significant UN peacekeeping enforcement deployment will be required, right? I'm not just talking about peacekeeping in terms of the monitoring that we've had with Minerso since 1991. I'm talking about a UN peacekeeping force that will have to be put in place uh, for a period of several years to make sure that both sides, particularly Morocco, respect the parameters of the agreement, right? Uh, and that is something that can only happen under the coercive powers of the UN Security Council. And the council has steadfastly refused to go to chapter seven on this question. But there's no way in which an autonomy could be a viable solution to Western Sahara. You know, you're not gonna get the refugees out of the camps unless there's an international peace enforcement force that has the ability to protect civilians from aggressive behaviors of the central Moroccan government. Right. So is the international community really willing to put that much on the line for autonomy uh, when they won't lift a finger for self-determination and independence?
uh, and I'll leave things right there.